I want to speak about MPS in space. Maybe in space. There's a question mark, and this is there on purpose. So I'm, I'm, I'm Andreas Waldmann, I'm speak for OHB system. And this is the topic to talk about. Who is OHB? What are we doing? Why do we think that MPS might or still or will or can help us in solving our problems and producing our products? And now is the big question, why is it so hard to introduce a new technology like MPS in our environment? And I want to briefly show you some, some, some impressions on some activities that we've done with MPS. So who is OHB? OHB is a group of a family of, of, of companies that are all like focused on the aerospace technology area. So we do all kinds of things. One company in there is the OHB system that is uh, has premises in, in Bremen and Mun in Munich and we focus on the spacecraft and satellite business. So what we do is we build satellites, for example the Galileo satellites, that the European GPS thing that's built by us. We do weather satellites, telecommunication satellites and while well we are a rather s young company in this in this business so still growing very very fast. At OHB Systems, we do design and integration of entire satellite systems. So we buy all kinds of equipment, put them together, that's uh, integrated in a huge engineering process, and we write the flight software that is executed on a computer on board, as well as some additional software that is executed on ground to operate it. So the engineering process in developing a satellite mission is a very long-term activity, I would say. For well, first we have to have a, a contract and a mission, and that's a political deci decision. So there are years of discussions, mostly, m most times, um, prior to a contract when we start working on it. Once we work on it, it takes even, well, very long to do all the mission needs analysis, pre-development activities, requirements engineering for that specific mission. Then we um, need to design the satellite system, taking into account all the, all the mission needs, doing the software development, test verific uh, verification, validation of the software and of the integrated satellite that takes up to 10 years, sometimes even longer. So from the kickoff of a project to the launch of the satellite, it's a very, very long time to go. Once we are in space, we have to operate and maintain the system for up to 18 years. Of course, that varies from, from mission to mission. So we especially see those 10 years engineering in the middle, that is a very, very long time, uh, time, time scale. And we have to speed up this step significantly, especially with these um, new activities that, that they call new space activities, like fast satellite developments. And we have a kickoff, and you have to launch like half a year later or a, li year, a year later. So you have to get better there. And we hope that MPS might help us doing that. So. When we look at the problem that we have to solve, we find very, very much reused design patterns. So we have few uh, design patterns in the, in the flight software and also in the operational software that we are applying very, very often. So that calls for abstraction, right? That's, for example, telecommanding. A telecommand sent to the satellite is interpreted and executed on board. We produce a stream of telemetry data in a, spe a specific format. So it's all very, very formalized um, things. We can find lots of design pattern that we can reuse there. And on the other side, we have to, um, we have to uh, qualify our software and our, our entire system. And um, we have to go by lots of, lots of different standards. So we have to write documents and show the customer that we are compliant to those standards. Um, another thing is, it's, it's we don't just build a software there, we build a system, and the system has different disciplines on there. There's a thermal engineer, there's the, the guy who's, who's doing the navigation and, and the guidance, and, and there's so many different um, disciplines involved in the engineering process, and every engineering uh, discipline looks at the same problem at the same satellite with a different view. So we have different scopes, different tools, different languages even, where um, people talk about the same thing. 
So wh why do we think MPS is good for us? Because it helps us in both aspects. We can abstract from communalities of different missions and different and like focus on on the on the differences of different missions. So um, that's the language engineering aspect that is covered by MPS. And the model-based um, aspect covered by MPS may in future hopefully give us uh, the ability to have a, a model of our thing, our satellite, and provide different views uh, to the different disciplines, each formulated in their domain. So giving different views on the same on the same project. That's the big vision that we that we have here. But it's kind of hard to implement this in a I would say traditionally old fashioned industry. So it's we have long iteration cycles because we have small number of satellites and long development cycles. That's what I just mentioned. And we have a conservative environment people tend to say, well, okay, it's working now, we can develop our systems, never change a running system. Okay. The other aspect is the high quality requirements, we have to show everything. So if we change something in our tool chain, which has worked before, we have to somehow qualify and like, argue that our changes are good and doesn't break anything. Um, we have to work by mandatory standards, and these standards are well, they are not developed agile either in this uh, in this industry, of course. So there's a standard that's that's like 10 years old, and they have an iteration cycle of like 10 years where they look at it. And model-based engineering is hardly addressed in this standard at all. So if you want to introduce a new technology, we have to convince people to allow us going a little bit uh, like like bending the, the the standard that we have to comply with. Yes. Um, no, that's the ECSS and the GSWS, the Galileo software standard. They especially built a software standard for the Galileo project. That's and CCSDS. And so it's it's well, it's pretty comparable to to automotive standards, but it's it's an access standard, and you have the new term terminology and everything. Um, Okay, so this is this is a hard problem to, to, to convince people. What do we do? We try to convince them by just doing and trying things. So as part of a activity that was funded by ESA, we were able to play around with MPS. And in that activity, we built extensions to the embedded C language. And these extensions really match the, the pattern that we that we use in our software development. So for instance, when I talk about telecommanding, the satellite receives the telecommand, it's always the same pattern. We have to check the parameters, the ranges, and everything. And so there's an extension to Embedder C that is capable of like easing our work and implementing the software there. And of course, one very, very important part is generating documentation from it. So this initial project here allows allowed us to investigate on the on the great opportunities that are offered by by uh, MPS and, and and better, so we played around with it and um, delivered a final package to ESA for them to give us feedback. And well, still pending, <laughs> but we are very convinced that this is a good way to go. Another little project that um, well that I started is, well, we have to, as I mentioned, we have to do all kinds of analysis. And this is one analysis that um, ended up at my desk all the time. Do a software schedulability analysis of a flight software. That is, well, we have a set of timing requirements and we have to prove it somehow that these timing requirements are always met at all and under, under all conditions. And while there are, there are mathematical models, it's pretty straightforward how to approach that. And for, for earlier projects, um, we just used an Excel spreadsheet, of course, plus some visual basic scripts, and it somehow proved that our deadlines are always met. But at some point, the complexity of the software I had to analyze was just too complex. So what do I do? Um, I had to change the mathematical model that is calculating these uh, these the, the response times. So what the I, I just wasn't brave enough to dig into the visual basic script and patch those and adapt them to the needs. So I did write a DSL, an MPS, 
to capture my tasking model and do all these calculations running an in, in, in interpreter in the background and also allowing me to generate a visualization of what's really going on in the on-mode software. So um, using the, the embedded documentation language, it was even um, possible to, to like extend it a little bit, refer into the, into the uh, tasking model language on the, on the left side and on a push button generate a document that we could deliver and that, would that was generated and actually readable and well generating a 50 or 60 page document with actual numbers up to date this is something that well cost us a lot of time before and now it's just a matter of, of, of seconds to just regenerate the document third thing just started a master thesis where a student of mine he um, well is developing a language that is mapping an implementation in our onboard software extension language to, to the embedder, which is on the, on the left side. And on the right side, we have um, an architecture that is implied to us from, from the customer. So all these standards, they also define a certain architecture that we have to comply with. So if we write an onboard software, we have to comply with that standard for that customer and for a different architecture with the, others, with the, with the other customer. So we don't want to rewrite our software, but we want to just show our compliance to the different layering architectures that are allowed. So the idea of this language is to allow a mapping between our implementation and the standard that we have to comply with. Okay, and that's all we've done so far. Thank you. The question is, where do I get the timing information for doing the scalability analysis, right? Um, well, I, I analyze the, the binary with an external tool. That is a different approach. That's nothing integrated with MPS. I'm thinking about doing that, but it's, that's uh, absolutely external. And that is exporting that information into some kind of text files, which are then imported into MPS and then then the numbers are there to to do the calculation with there was another Nico uh, this summer last summer summer of seventeen it's still pending it's uh, it's okay that's normal. <laughs> Are there, Daniel? Mm, roughly a hundred thousand lines of C code. It's about. Um, well, in our company, yes. Other companies also do ADA code, but it's there's hardly any uh, more up-to-date language used in in flying code. The processor, uh, that's a Leon 2, for example, that's our high-end processor running at 65 megahertz and well, we have like something about 6 to 8 megabytes of memory. <laughs> but that's the high-end, the, the Galileo satellites, they are like, it's, that's an ERC32, so it's, um, I think it's 20 megahertz sufficient. <laughs> Yes, yes. We can't touch it anymore, but we can uh, send commands. And actually, it's a memory upload, and then we can patch the software by copying over to the to the flash memory. It's another one. Yes, yes, yes. We're load using old technology, flying old technology, mostly because. <laughs> Yes, yes, because of the radiation and, and al also, well, we have to qualify every part and that's a long process to qualify a, 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 a processor. I, 
I think they test for for a year, and then they say, okay, this this device is fine. You can use it. So We discussed yesterday whether we use formal methods in improving our software correct, right, or certain aspects of it. Uh, let's put it that way. I, I would love to do it. <laughs> and I think with this technology, we, we, we're getting there to, uh, like, being able to do that. But it's, it's not uh, mandatory by the standards to do that for whatever reason. Well, why? Because 10 years ago when those standards were written, it was technically not, not possible to do that. Okay. <laughs>